Bobby. Um, I will be talking about modularization of JavaScript, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. You've likely worked with the module system in JavaScript if you write JavaScript. And I'm going to be talking about how we're rethinking the design of modules and how that works in a technology such as JavaScript, which must be backwards compatible. It's an interesting problem. Um, we'll go through a few parts here, but uh, first let me introduce myself. Um, my name is Yulia Startsev. I work on SpiderMonkey. SpiderMonkey is, of course, the JavaScript and WASM engine inside of Firefox. We are also embedded into a couple of other technologies, such as uh, GNOME and CouchDB, I believe, and um, a couple of other propri proprietary projects. Um, in addition, we are the JavaScript engine for Servo. And uh, you can embed us in both Rust and C++ projects. Uh, we have information on, on that on, on our website. So um, to get started, to get us started on this conversation, I'll give you a short history of modularization for JavaScript. Many languages introduced modularization earlier than we did, but uh, there's a bit of context there. So here is a snippet of code from the Firefox code base. Uh, the text is a little bit small, but it says uh, initial JS component loader work. Uh, the date is September 7th, 1999. And um, this is a piece of code that allows you to uh, load what we might refer to as server-side JavaScript or like application JavaScript um, in the Firefox browser. And it was a project for us for a long time that we wanted to build the browser with the web technologies that the browser runs. Yes. Um, now, I have a particular relationship with this code because I just spent the last three years refactoring it so that we could introduce um, ES modules. Where many people probably are familiar with modularization in JavaScript is with server.js, which later was renamed to common.js. Um, this was also an initiative that came from Mozilla because we were using so much server-side, or what we might call server-side or system JavaScript, and we wanted a better system for how to do that because uh, the way that JavaScript works is it's normally embedded via script tags and then everything is exposed through the global. We'll get into some of the problems there. This uh, method of uh, modularization of JavaScript that was introduced in this blog post became very popular because a couple of months after this blog post was published, Node.js came up. So uh, let's just quickly understand how CommonJS works. You have a file and uh, it has some work that it's doing at the top and some work it's doing at the bottom. In the middle somewhere uh, we have this require call. And when we make this require call, um, so what's already happened is we've already parsed this file and we're executing. So as we're executing, we hit this function called this is require, and then from that, we go and synchronously load that file and run it. Now, if there's another require statement in that file, we again pause execution, stop, go get that file, execute, parse it, execute it, and then return to our original call site and continue. And the same goes for the parent file. Now, this isn't a problem when you're dealing with um, a local file storage, because the access time is actually quite a bit faster than, for example, if you're running on a, um, on a system that has your files distributed across the network. So uh, we, have, um, we have a certain uh, set of design principles for the web platform, which you can look up. Uh, it's the tag design pr principles for the web platform. And one of them is that uh, we do not block the main thread for doing network access or this kind of long-term work. Because the experience for developers, for not developers, pardon me, for users is actually very poor. So the uh, design of CommonJS, uh, while it heavily inspired ES modules, we took a lot of things from it, ultimately this specific aspect of it has been a pain point ever since. We could not do synchronous loading. There were several attempts to fix this. This is one of the most well-known, which was uh, the AMD system, which took a lot of what CommonJS is, but it also made it asynchronous. Six years after the blog post was published, uh, TC39 finally standardized the ES6 module system, 
you'll recognize it in files with its import-export syntax and by a couple of other um, special behavior that module files have. Um, and uh, everyone was very happy that we got this done. In fact, look at this lovely graph of module usage on the web. It's doing everything it should be. It's going up and to the right. Uh, but, um, of course, graphs can be very misleading, and in fact, the reality is that only about 8% of all page loads on the internet are making use, uh, are even touching the module system. So that includes things like dynamic import, that includes static import, and that makes browser developers, who have to spend quite a bit of money to develop this sort of thing, ask, why did we do this? <laughs> it's, been, it's been like eight years. And uh, yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. How did we end up in this situation where only 8% of page loads are making use of modules, and yet 90% of developers are using modules when they author JavaScript? It's an interesting problem to think about. So uh, this brings me to the agenda for today. We've just finished the prelude, which is the history. We will talk about how the module system works, because understanding how that system works helps us understand what the problems with it are. We will talk about why it isn't being used more, and whether or not that's really a problem. And finally, we're going to explore the solution space and what it means to redesign in the context of backwards compatibility. Let's get started. So, how do ES modules work? I've got a couple of graphics here. I'll be using this visual language to try and communicate uh, very briefly different uh, subjects so you can, um, you can associate with the icons um, different concepts, and uh, yeah, let's get started. So, uh, for items that I've selected out of the uh, properties of modules are as follows that we'll talk about. We'll talk a little bit about namespacing, we'll talk about importing objects, exposing our objects, and cycle breaking. So, first of all, namespacing. What do I mean in this case? What's the fundamental problem that modules were meant to solve? Well, before we introduced modules, the way that you got information um, into a global space that like multiple scripts could access on the web was you would put your script tag and you would assign something to the global. In the case of the browser, of course, it would be the window object, that's our global. In Node, there's a global object. Um, in Firefox, we actually had another type of global object. So you could say, okay, I want to put uh, some string A on the window. Then later on, I want to put some string B. And then eventually, I want to put some string Z on that global, and then at this point I've forgotten what I've done and I'm uh, overriding over the same work that I had done before, and um, this makes for a mess, and it becomes very confusing, and it's difficult to separate code, it's difficult to think about projects, it's difficult to maintain large pieces of code. So uh, this is the fundamental problem that modules are addressing. Um, in order to be able to uh, isolate variables or isolate uh, things into namespaces, we then need to be able to expose things from that namespace. And the way that we do that is very simple. We just have a list. Here are the things that are being exposed from this file after we've parsed the file. So for example, that's this syntax, export const a and whatever a is. And the second piece to this is importing. So. Uh, the, the other side of exporting objects is, of course, being able to bring them into another file. And this is done in a very similar way to exporting. So, and, and also additionally, it's done with this syntax. But this is more complicated than exporting because you'll notice that we have here a relative URL. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about URLs later, but what's important to note here is that um, this URL is incomplete we need to resolve this URL to a concrete URL. So this actually must go and speak to something called a host. A host is the environment in which the scripting language is running, in which JavaScript is running. So um, it's the thing that we go to to delegate um, the kinds of work that JavaScript cannot do. So for example, what, the, what kind of things can JavaScript not do? It can't do set timeout. So set timeout is a DOM API. JavaScript doesn't have a sense of a clock. Uh, it has no idea of how to resolve or do network re requests. So all of that work goes to the hosts. And we have an API that allows us, um, an API, okay. We have um, a way of writing our specification that allows us to indicate at which points we are delegating to the host. 
this is a very important one for the module system, when we go to the host to determine the URL. Okay, so the data structure that I've described for you just now is called the module record. Um, there's more to it than this, but to simplify it, uh, we have three parts to it. We have the parsed source, we have the import entries, which require the support of the, um, of the host, and we have the exports. Let's now understand how we load an ES6 module. First of all, we don't both parse and execute the file. We instead start with the parse. Then, um, from that parse, we uh, look at the uh, we look at the uh, uh, result of the parse, whether it's an AST node, uh, AST tree, or something else, and we start extracting things such as the imports and resolving them. Then, uh, once we have found a concrete URL that we want to go to, we say, okay, go and load, go fetch, load that file, and parse that file. And then we will go and construct the same data structure for that file. Pretty simple, like, we're just, uh, we're just fetching files, we're parsing them, and we're building data structures out of them. In context, how do these things work? So, um, what we have here is called the fetch parse loop. So we are continuously just running through this loop. Let's take a look at a concrete example of how the algorithm runs. This is a list of files. I probably should have, uh, I forgot to gray out the text. Um, this is a list of files. So we have this structure of three files. Um, going from main.js is our entry point into the module graph. Then we have path.js, and then we have another model, module.js. It's a linear graph. Uh, it's a pretty simple example. So let's go through this rather quickly. Main.js has not been fetched or loaded or linked. Probably this is your script tag um, that says type module and gives you a URL. So at this point, we're like, okay, we just need to get main.js. We've changed the state to fetching. We fetch the file. The uh, browser tells us that it's been fetched. We update the state. And then we start linking. Now, uh, for the next two, I'm actually going to skip the double transition of fetching to fetched because it just makes it longer and we're effectively doing the same thing. So we're going to use linking and linked as a shorthand for, uh, for this part. So we start linking, and linking is uh, we are in the process of going and getting all of our dependencies off the network. So our first dependency is path.js, so we start fetching, we get it back, we start linking path.js, it's in the state of linking now, and then we go and get its dependency, which is another module.js, it switches to the linking uh, state, and then because it has no dependencies, we update it to being linked, which means that it has completed its uh, search for dependencies. It's ready to be executed. Great. Since another module.js is the only dependency of path.js, we update path.js also to linked. Great. And then main.js uh, does the same, and now we have finished the uh, initialization phase of the module graph. If anyone's curious, the evaluation stage looks exactly the same. But what happens when you have yet another, uh, yet another path? And uh, it's actually got a circular reference to a previous file. So in this case, you've got a cyclical dependency. Lots of module systems prevent you from, uh, prevent you from doing this kind of coding for correctness reasons. But in JavaScript, we allow it. Uh, one of the goals of JavaScript is to be a very provisional language. Provisional meaning you can sketch easily in the programming language. You can, uh, you don't need to be as concerned about types or things that uh, make your code very concrete about what it's doing. Um, so we allow cyclical dependencies sort of out of the box. How do we do cycle breaking? It is precisely this data structure. It's a global data structure on the module loader. When we have a cyclical um, relationship between two files, then we just check this module map, and if something is already linked or evaluated or fetched or any of the other states that are not the initial state, we automatically update our state to linked. So very quickly, why did we choose URLs? This has been a compatibility issue with Node.js. The reason is that URLs are one of the uh, underpinning security mechanisms of the web browser. So a lot of um, a lot of policies such um, CSP and C, uh, COEP are based off of URLs. 
And if we wanted to like create a new way to do this, first of all, we would have to figure out the routing across the network. How do we do that? Then we would have to figure out how to create new security policies on all of this stuff. And we would effectively be reinventing the same data structure that we already have. So that was the decision there. So let's quickly summarize. What is the module system? It's async and non-interrupting. We allow cyclic dependencies, and we rely on the host, not only for the security mechanism, but for other pieces. And finally, we have a global module map that allows us to um, resolve conflicts, uh, re resolve uh, cycles e efficiently. Let's go back to this uh, initial image that we started with. So the problem that we started to notice was, uh, as a committee that, that we noticed, was we were having low usage of modules, but they were very popular. Why? And uh, this was a question that I had been thinking about for a while because I had been tasked in Firefox to um, update our custom module system to ES6. One problem we were having is it was very difficult to hire people for working on that system and to onboard them and teach them how to work with it because there were a lot of custom ways to work with it. And it would be just so much more efficient if we could just use ES6. So I spent some time thinking about it and uh, working through what our actual use cases were in our code base. And the problem was we needed the original synchronous behavior because the synchronous behavior allowed us to defer the load until a much later point. So for example, if we loaded all of the JavaScript files just off of the computer, it would take us uh, it would impact our start time significantly, sometimes by 50%. So that was a, that was a um, reality that we couldn't do, that we couldn't, uh, that we couldn't pay for. So moving to ES6 modules as they were spec sounded really great, but it wasn't something that we could ultimately do. So um, I've introduced a proposal to committee called Deferred Module Evaluation. Uh, what this proposal is trying to do is to highlight the problem that we're having on Firefox and also try to understand how we can solve this that's compatible with the web context. Because if we solve this just for Firefox, then one day someone down the line might introduce something that allows us to do this and we're going to have to do the same three-year refactoring that I've just been through. So um, here's an example file. Let's say you're importing a method from uh, a.js and it's being used in three different functions. They're all rarely called. You don't call them at startup. You call them eventually, but you don't, definitely don't call them now. However, we've already done the link parse uh, evaluate loop for, uh, for a.js. So um, a natural uh, solution to this on the web would be to use dynamic import. So that's great. Here we have an async function with a dynamic import with an await in there. Um, and what impact does that actually have on the code base? Well, the impact that you end up having on the code base is all of your functions that were using your method now suddenly need to be asynchronous. Um, this is something that we might refer to as being very viscous. This is a viscous change. The nature of asynchronous code in JavaScript results in, um, uh, results in a lot of unnecessary changes to the code in order to express what was there before. And what's happening here, when you think about it, these awaits are not meaningful in terms of what the code is doing. They're meaningful as a layer of performance on top of what the code was originally doing. And the amount of work and also additionally the semantic change that occurs when you switch from synchronous to uh, relying on the event loop to resolve these things uh, can be significant and can result in very difficult to debug bugs. Additionally, just to <laughs> drive this home a bit, there are people on the internet who say, do not use ESM modules because uh, CJS clients cannot use them, and this is a compatibility risk. So that was one other thing. Anyway, the, um, uh, the proposal itself, deferred module evaluation, the goal of it is to resolve this issue and provide a way for us to uh, not synchronously load, but synchronously run modules later on. I'm not going to get into the details of how deferred module evaluation works. Uh, you can certainly look at the proposal or come talk to me later. I'm going to talk about a broader problem because 
uh, it wasn't just me that noticed that there was something wrong with the system. Uh, bundlers noticed that there was something wrong with the module system too. Recall this graph, we'll be coming back to it a lot. 8% um, of page loads are making use of the module system because a lot of people are using bundlers. Bundlers allow um, developers to very uh, to package their code into a much more efficient representation for sending over the network. If they know that they need to have all of this JavaScript up front, they can just send it and it can be there readily available for use. However, modules require that you make multiple network round trips in order to get all of the pieces of information in place. So, in fact, the module system for a large JavaScript application doesn't really work. It's not the right vehicle to deliver that code. So what bundlers have been asking is, uh, and there's another problem to this as well, uh, bundlers remove the, the relationship between modules when they do their bundling. And they'd rather actually preserve that for like debugging information and other pieces. What they've been asking for is they've been saying, look, we know that the module system isn't being touched by the browser when code is hitting the browser and that browsers are annoyed by this, but um, we would really love to be able to use the, uh, the native module system in browsers. What we want is a way to talk about modules without, uh, without stripping them of their context. We want a way to describe modules in a file. That's currently impossible. You can't talk about module records in, in, um, in line inside of a file. <clears throat> so what they were asking for is, in order to do better bundling, they need to have a way to talk about modules. And finally, I want to talk about the WASM case, which um, is also very interesting and also, these may seem very disparate, but they're actually all related. <laughs> the WASM case has yet another problem that they introduced. They wanted a way to import a module without, um, without having to run through the entire event loop. Because the problem that they were running into is they need to be able to inspect which well, what they're loading as a WASM module before it gets instantiated. So here we have the import statement, and what they're doing is uh, they have a WebAssembly instantiate function, and they're passing in a WASI import and WASI snapshot preview one and the WASI snapshot preview one um, property. So they want to be able to customize how the instantiation and loading is happening on the WASM side, and this is currently impossible in JavaScript. And the ESM integration proposal for WASM does not uh, allow this to be done. So we had several pieces that were all kind of touching the module system, but we weren't entirely sure uh, how they fit together, like what were we going to do with all these pieces. So to summarize, actually the summary page is not important. Basically, components, better bundling, <laughs> deferred module evaluation, were three proposals that sort of came up independent of each other, we started thinking about them, and it started a broader conversation at committee about what should we do with the module system. Because there were more things that we couldn't do with modules. We couldn't reinstantiate a module. For example, once you load a module once, um, even if you try to dynamically import it, it's going to be a singleton. We're going to rely back onto the same system, um, even if you try to get it a second time. So there's no way to get uh, two copies of the same module. You cannot remove a module, you cannot unlink it. So let's say you run a piece of code and you only use it once and then you want to get rid of it, then there's no way to do that. Or for example, if you want to do hot reloading, so you've loaded a page, um, you're working on a specific module, you just want that one to reload, that's not possible with our current system. You have to reload the entire thing. That brings us to a lot of other interesting use cases. For example, low memory module reuse, uh, we have a microcontroller that's running JavaScript. What they want to be able to do is they want to be able to talk about a module completely isolated from, um, from its bindings, completely isolated from all other information, in order to be able to instantiate it in multiple ways, potentially with multiple paths. We have the hot reloading case. We also have testing frameworks telling us that they want to be able to do persistent testing by ma manipulating the module system. So that brings us to the question, how do we get our existing module system to fix this? This is one of my favorite visualizations about what we want the web to be able to do when we are gradually evolving in. Uh, it's a pure CSS friend scene, 
And uh, this is, I think, a great illustration of backwards compatibility. This was in Chrome, and looking absolutely lovely, this is what the uh, original artist had intended the image to look like. This is what it looked like in an old version of Opera. And here we have it in Netscape Navigator. Uh, my favorite part of this image is as you move back in time in technology, you move uh, to more and more modern art. <laughs> so <laughs> what's most striking here is in every case, you can recognize that this is a figure. You can recognize what the intent is of this image. So, um, let's get started with talking about TC39 and how we standardize things. To give you a really quick um, description, uh, the vehicle that we use to, uh, to talk to each other is a proposal. It's a, it's a series of documents. Uh, you have a specification usually in there, usually from stage two. Uh, you also have something called an explainer, which is often the most important document. Uh, the explainer gives us a sense of what the motivation for a proposal is, the use cases where that motivation is being demonstrated, uh, solutions, comparison of solutions, interactions, um, prior art, often from other languages, but sometimes from libraries in JavaScript, and frequently asked questions. What we were faced with in committee was we had a stack of these. We just had a bunch of different proposals that were overlapping, trying to manipulate similar parts of the spec, and it would be an absolute mess if we tried to do this, uh, if we tried to do this using our usual process. The other thing is, um, at committee, what I've noticed is that it's very easy to become overwhelmed by information. So when you have a really big technical space that you need to solve, um, and you're one of 50 people in a room who's solving it, it's very easy to check out and be like, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm sure Michael knows what's going on. I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna pretend that this is all fine for me and, and it's fine. But that's, that's a problem because uh, having people check out and not pay attention means that we don't get as strong critique. People uh, who have experience, who could tell us, oh, actually, that's a bad idea, they don't because it's just too much information, they're busy, they have a job, they've got other things that they're concerned about, they've got other proposals they're concerned about. So structuring information in a way that is digestible, that is uh, a way that we can move quickly through uh, using a shorthand to describe to one another the problems we're solving, uh, why we're solving the problems the way that we are, um, what we've considered, how it's all structured, it facilitates critique which means that we can more clearly articulate to one another why something is a bad idea. And we can more quickly articulate to one another why we think that a design needs to be changed. And that is ultimately the goal with a language design in a context as important as JavaScript. JavaScript is something that you know, the people on the committee are all responsible for. And uh, we are responsible for ensuring that its development is uh, sustainable, it's long-term, something that's future-proof, something that's not going to break the experience for people in the that are using older technologies. Um, it's something that we really need to focus on the ultimate end user, not necessarily just developers. So we have a lot of responsibility when we're thinking about redesigning something like this. Um, and here's a nice quote. Uh, it's, <laughs> I don't know who it's from because my husband forgot. Um, but um, architecture is a way to deal with the how questions. And while what I'm going to show you isn't exactly software architecture, it's rather a structuring of proposals and how pieces fit together, it's more like a tech tree. Uh, I think that this is an interesting thing to think about because we are sort of thinking about how do we do this. So we're going to have a really interesting talk <laughs> by Franz Thoma on uh, Factorio, which is a game I also like very much, and I wanted to show this to you to give you an immediate sense of, um, of what we're going to do. This is the tech tree from Factorio, where uh, as you're, as you're uh, building up your factory, you are choosing which components you're going to select and develop. And uh, as you select certain things, it gives you abilities to do things that you didn't have before. For example, you might be able to do things faster, that's an ability. You might be able to build bigger factories, that's an ability. You might be able to do more science. I'm sure Franz will uh, I'll talk about this in depth. Uh, but uh, I'm, of course, not the first person to mention this. This is coming up in uh, various circles. 
Um, this is from WebAssembly. This is their uh, post MVP roadmap, also inspired. Uh, it's a communication mechanism as well. It's also inspired by video game skill trees. And here it's talking about what's going to happen after 2017 in WebAssembly. And uh, I'm sure, uh, I personally am very excited to hear Andy Wingo talk about this, but here we have 2017. Um, as part of the roadmap for what will happen in WebAssembly, we have compiled to JS languages, but also gen more generally compiled to higher level languages, uh, in particular languages that need GC. And this is a proposal that is finally moving forward in WebAssembly. So to give you a little bit of context in terms of the standard space, uh, this kind of visualization can be really interesting to have, even if it's a snapshot at a certain point, to be able to, to um, identify where we are in terms of the development of standard. So, um, in committee, uh, in fact, I introduced the concept of layered proposals in a different context, which was pattern matching, but um, another, uh, it was the module group that actually liked the idea. And what we're doing is we're doing something called a layered proposal. It's a new concept for us. It's a new way for us to communicate this information. It's basically a stack of proposals, but they're organized. The organizing principle is that the structure is determined by the dependencies, exactly how you would imagine a tech tree. So for all of you gamers, you already know exactly what I'm gonna tell you about this. Um, it looks a little bit like this. So if you've got de any dependency, it goes on the next layer from its dependency. Um, when we define a layer, uh, because uh, when people hear that their work might be interrupted, they get very nervous, so layers are very flexible. A layer is a collection of work that has the same dependencies or uh, where the two, layer, uh, the two proposals on that layer must be worked on in parallel together. A layer is completed when all of its proposals advance. Notably, no work is ever blocked by a layer. So let's say you want to work on a layer 3 proposal, but layer 0 hasn't finished its work. You can continue working on layer 3. That's not a problem. Um, all of these things can be happening in concert, but we understand that there are pieces that we are depending on that need to move into the specification before uh, a layer 3 proposal specification is complete. Here is the concrete map of the module's work. You'll notice that this is significantly larger than what I've described to you so far, because I don't think that we will have enough time to go through all of it. Um, and if we look at the expanded map, actually one thing that I'll mention is, I've also named the layers and broken them up in order to better describe what kind of work we'll be doing on each one. The first one is uh, exposing the module object, uh, the, which is layer zero. Layer one is import export modification, layer two is virtualization, and layer three is to be determined. Um, as we get deeper into the layers, the picture of what is being achieved becomes hazier, which I think is often the case. Uh, here is the full module map of the work that we have planned on TC39. Uh, you'll be able to look at these slides yourselves later on, so I'll just quickly explain a little bit about the iconography here. Um, the dotted lines are the capabilities that are being opened, and the solid lines are the concrete proposals that make up the module system refactor. We're going to look at two, and only two, and we're going to look at the layers that it unlocks in terms of work. So, our focus is fundamentally the module record that I described to you earlier. So you already know what this, uh, what this, um, what this is and how it works. And let's take a look at what the refactoring looks like. So, um, wait, I'm missing a slide. Okay, that's fine. Um, the module record. Uh, why is the module record a problem? Why do we want to change what this is? Well, the problem with module records is that they require a host. They require that uh, you have information that isn't present purely in the file. The only information that's really present purely in the file is the parsed source. Import entries require that you call out to the host and ask, where am I going, where am I? in order to get that information. This is binding information. And exports can also require binding information. So this becomes a problem for certain proposals like um, the, um, 
I'm blanking on it right now. This is a problem, for example, for microcontrollers, because they want to be able to reroute where modules are pointing to, just from the source. It's also a problem for, um, well, let's, let's leave that example. So, what the refactoring is, is we split this original object into two pieces. The first piece is the module source, which just has the parsed source, and the other piece is uh, the module. It's called module, it's sometimes called module instance, if you read the, if you read the proposal text, which takes on the binding information. Ah, yeah, that's what I was looking for, okay. Module source is very simple. The purpose of module source is to contain statically analyzable information and nothing else. Uh, the module, the module, or the module instance, or various other names, um, it's being worked on two separate proposals. They're called module expressions and module declarations, but they both do the same thing, which is the they expose the uh, unevaluated bound module record that we saw before, but it's unevaluated. Uh, yes, okay. And this unlocks the following two layer one capabilities. The first one is um, import reflection, and the second one is import attributes. Import attributes, some of you may be familiar with it already because we've had a very popular proposal called import assertions. Import assertions allowed you to change the parser that was used uh, for an import to JSON, or alternatively to CSS. We just pulled that back to stage two. Um, the reason that these two need to be worked on together is because they are populating the same syntax space. And we were having, a, uh, it w it's not the reason why we pulled the proposal back to stage two, but one of the things that we needed to do was to understand how um, the two sides of the import statement would interact with one another in terms of the design of the import statement. So prior to these two proposals, these two boxes didn't exist. Import reflection, uh, no, sorry, import assertion introduced this box here, and we spent a very long time on this syntax, which looks very simple. It used to be called assert. We're trying to rename it to with. It took years to get to this point. Um, and then on the left-hand side, we have this new module syntax, which we are also still discussing, uh, because um, the load modifier, um, the name of it's going to be module, but if you're familiar with JavaScript, like what have you been loading this whole time if you haven't been loading modules? So now you're going to be writing import module for, for what? So there's still some discussion in terms of what the syntax level um, design is going to look like for these. The other thing that uh, the layer zero proposals unlock is ergonomic multi-threading. Um, in the past, if you wanted to send a script to a worker, you either needed to have it already in a file, or you needed to, um, or you needed to use a blob URL string and pass that into a worker. Of course, a blob URL string will run into various CSP security mechanisms that can become annoying, and then you start modifying your CSP in order to accept them, which isn't what we want. So, um, and additionally, like, you would have that string instantiated in multiple places. So, what many folks have been asking is to be able to ergonomically pass uh, dynamically created modules in the context of a file to workers. And uh, that's exactly what we have here. This is new syntax. You have the module keyword. And what we're doing is uh, allowing you to uh, pass that module and add it into a worker or multiple workers with multiple instantiation. Finally, the last thing that this allows us is because now we have the module keyword, in the exact same way, we can do inline modules. So bundlers now have a, um, well, they don't, they don't now have, we're, this is what we're working on, we're still specifying this work. Uh, we will be able to give bundlers a target where they will be able to make use of the browser's module system. And that looks like this. Again, module keyword, and then you can import at the bottom of the file or in other files that import the main file. This gives us better bundling. So, uh, just to bring us back to the whole map of work that's going on, I have not touched on a lot of capabilities. I haven't, for example, touched at all on, on synthetic modules, where let's say you want to define your own module type that's like uh, giving you TypeScript types. I haven't talked about that. I haven't talked about post-virtualization, which allows you to modify 
how imports are done or how things are evaluated. I haven't touched on evaluators. And I will say that while I have put everything that I could uh, that I could on this slide in terms of what we're working on, I personally don't know if all of this will go in, and this is just work that we are currently thinking about. For example, I'm personally very unsure that we're going to do sandboxing. You can come talk to me about that later, about why I think that might not be possible. So uh, this gives you an idea. We'll be filling this out over time, over the next five years, I believe, is the work that we're looking at. Uh, you'll see things land slowly, some things will land quickly, and uh, we are very happy to have feedback. So this last page is um, some links. If you're curious and want to learn more about the work that we're currently doing, uh, please feel free to get in touch with the champions if you've got additional use cases, if you've got additional problems with the module system. We're very interested in hearing from people and better understanding what they need as we design. Thank you. I have a question. You said stage two. Could you describe the stages of the standardization process? I was told that slide was boring, yeah. so I pulled it out. <laughs> uh, I did have a slide on, on the TC39 process. Um, TC39 has a four-stage process. It was introduced with ES6. Um, basically, anybody here in this room can write a proposal and you're automatically in stage zero. In stage one, you've presented the proposal to committee, and the committee hasn't told you it's a terrible idea. Uh, effectively, uh, we, we accept a lot of things into stage one. It's effectively saying the committee supports the exploration of the problem space. Not necessarily that we believe that uh, the problem space should be solved or that we've accepted the problem. Stage two means we have accepted the problem and that uh, we believe that the general solution that has been proposed is the right shape for solving that problem. And then stage three is implementation, stage four is uh, specification. All right. There's a question. Marco. Might be a stupid question, but uh, uh, might be a little bit of a stupid question, sorry for that. But you described the process of uh, loading and linking the files. So when does the passing happen? That's a very good question. So um, uh, the parsing happens after the fetch. So what we do is uh, when we see that we need to get a file from the network, uh, we say, hey, network component, in the case of Firefox, it's called Neko. We say, hey, can you go and get me the thing that's at this URL? And that can return an error or it can return successfully, in which case we will get a string of bytes. And those bytes will be parsed by, uh, the, um, by the parser. Um, in this case, it'll be parsing into something called a module goal. So if you look at the specification, you'll notice that we have two distinct goals. A goal in the context of JavaScript is your starting point, uh, your overall node for the entire script. And the two of them work slightly differently. So for modules, you parse into the module goal, and that actually gives you access to the import syntax. And then after that, you do linking and fetching, again parsing, and we're always, uh, once you're locked into the module system, you can't get out of it. What's the difference if you load the normal JavaScript or something the module? Yes, there is a difference. Um, there are a couple of differences. The most noticeable one is the fact that you have access to import-export syntax. The one that a lot of people don't realize is that you're automatically in strict mode. And there are a couple of other distinctions. Percent number I found quite interesting. Sorry, can you uh, eight percent number? Eight percent mm -hmm. number of page loads use uh, modules. Uh, do you have any statistics about the other workaround things like uh, I don't know AMD or UI and things like that? Uh, I don't have them off the top of my head. I do know that um, uh, that uh, those are all still very heavily used. And if you want to have full compatibility, you'll you'll be using a common JS solution. So as authors, uh, it's a, there was a quote there that uh, many authors prefer to use common JS because this is fully compatible across all systems. Uh, this is a contentious point. Um, having said that, um, 
like for example, Firefox has both common JS and our own custom system and ES6. We're actually running three different module systems. Plus, we've got multiple implementations of the module system. It's a bit of a mess right now. Um, maybe we can talk about that in more depth because uh, it might be a little bit, <laughs> a little bit boring for me to get into the details about this. Thank you, this was a really great presentation. Uh, my question is, if I understood correctly, you also work quite a bit on implementation side of things. How do you balance your time between working on proposals and the committee versus implementation? Like, do you have a goal in mind? Does it shift? Like, how, how does that process look like? I overwork. <laughs> Um, uh, so, uh, in a perfect world, I'm working 80% uh, of my time engineering, 20% of my time on specification. Um, in reality, uh, when you have a committee meeting coming up and you also have a deadline to ship something or you have a security sensitive crash, you just end up working too much. Um, and that's something I try to be careful about, especially today. Um, but unfortunately, standardization ends up being very much volunteer work because the, uh, there are a few places that hire you to purely work on standardization. Um, so you said that in JavaScript you really need to be fully backward compatible. Um, and I saw one example where you had these first class modules you pass around, you suddenly have a module keyword where probably there wasn't a module keyword before. Mm -hmm. Does this mean that, that module has been a keyword forever or were you introducing it at that point? And are you now stuck with the set of keywords you have and you can't add any new features that don't involve these particular keywords? That's a great question. Um, actually, there's a talk by Pierre Etienne, I, I don't know if I said that right, uh, that I'm actually quite interested in uh, looking at, which is um, tolerance towards change uh, in a system. Um, the way that we de design a lot of things in JavaScript when we're adding new syntax, for example, is we're looking for things that are errors because errors are a place that we can replace that with actual functionality, and in most cases, it's backwards compatible. I kind of fudged it a bit. We have broken backwards compatibility in very specific cases. For example, indirect eval. We broke uh, backwards compatibility on indirect eval because if we didn't, it would have been impossible to implement JITs. So uh, we do sometimes actually break with the past, but oftentimes the places that we choose to break are very specific, for example, error space, why can we introduce new syntax to the language? It's actually kind of controversial because introducing new syntax will break on older browsers. But the idea is that if something throws an error, then this is uh, less of a failure mode than other types of backwards compa compatible breaking changes. And in the case of the module keyword, uh, it's because the way that we parse it uh, with the curly brace, that's, um, that's invalid for um, other types of variable names. So if you have a variable named module and then you have the module keyword and you've got that curly brace with no line break. Um, so we have automatic semicolon insertion if you want to come talk to me about that later. How the parsing thing works here is a little bit complicated, but we have a mechanism. Um, so you said that the code is passed first before, before the imports are resolved. But this means that the imports cannot change the syntax of the script. Exactly. So, um, I mean, will there be a proposal or some addition, or is there a road to get there to, say, allow uh, macro or whatever mm -hmm. to be exported by, by your import? Because That's then you have to defer your, uh, yeah. your parting step, and then I'm not even sure how cycle dependencies will work out. So, mm -hmm. I mean, is it time to drop these, or...? Uh, That's an excellent question. Uh, uh, was there a comment? That's an excellent question. There is a proposal later down in the layers, deep, which allows you to customize how modules are evaluated. The way that we're handling that specific incompatibility that you brought up is uh, you will have to put uh, the new module tree that has a custom evaluator into a separate compartment, which doesn't touch the global module loader. So the global module loader is always uh, defined by the specification, but there is a proposal that will allow you to write a custom loader where you can pass a custom eval function. And for example, that custom eval function could, for example, parse Python, and then you could suddenly start loading in Python scripts 
via synthetic modules. I don't know if this will actually happen because there is a lot of complexity that opens up when we say that you can specify custom evaluators. So copy that answers when you're curious about it. We are thinking about it. I don't know if it'll happen. Any more questions? Then we're done on time. Thank you, Julia. Uh, thanks for waiting.